Well, today's Bible reading uh, will appear on the screen in a moment. Give you a chance to look it up in your own Bible as well, or uh, find it on your phone. Whatever pleases you, but it'd be good to have it open during the message. It's from Acts chapter 4, the first uh, 22 verses. Give you a quick background. You should remember to do that. In uh, the book of Acts, uh, the church has been born. The Holy Spirit has come. Uh, Jesus is risen, ascended, and has now sent out his servants and the apostles uh, into Jerusalem and the world uh, to bring the message of Jesus to the world. And in the section just before what we're about to read, um, Peter and John, two of the disciples of Jesus and the leaders of the church, um, performed a miraculous healing of a man who uh, could not walk. And they did it in the, in the temple, on the temple mount, and it created a commotion. And uh, Peter and John took the opportunity, as they usually did, to give an oration, a sermon uh, to the people about Jesus. This uh, agitated the Jewish leaders um, who thought they had put this Jesus thing to rest with the death of Christ, but clearly they had not. And uh, so they pulled John and Peter before them, before the council, and they, uh, they grill them and they attempt to uh, convince them to stop talking about Jesus. That's what Acts chapter 4 is about. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, it says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. And we thank God for his word. I've always found one intriguing part of that story is right at the end. Um, the kind of the assumption that if you're over 40... You really can't expect any miraculous or wonderful good things to come into your life. It's, it's over, okay? If he was under 40, sure, maybe. But if you're over 40, don't get your hopes up. 
Let me pray. Our Father, we come to your word now and we pray that you'd help us to understand it. And uh, in particular today, that you might grow in us a greater uh, humility and boldness because of Jesus. Amen. A humble boldness comes through Jesus, Acts chapter 4. Uh, my first question is, do you ever wonder what people really think of you? Well, we all do from time to time. Some of us worry about it a lot more, though. Do you ever wonder what people really think of you? If they were being 100% honest about you to another person, what would they say? Would it be good? Would it be bad? Isn't that a scary thought? Would I really want to know what other people would truthfully say? Now, I wonder what your friends think about your faith as a Christian what would they say about that or that part of you if they were being honest maybe they'd be too polite to say if they think it's a very foolish thing a recent McCrindle research survey that's an Australian research company um, asked people in Australia about their negative views of Christians some of the top responses were judgmental, self-righteous, acting superior to society, too much focus on authority. So if people are asked about who we are as Christians, do they say, well, well they're arrogant, judgmental? And here in Acts chapter 4, the first Christians are saying something that could be construed as arrogant. They are saying with absolute confidence, the only saving name is Jesus. You all have wicked ways you must turn away from, and we have heard from God, and we will speak no matter what you say, if you try to stop us. Is this confidence admirable or is it something bad? Is it arrogant, condescending? If you were to become a Christian, if you're not one at the moment, but you were to become one, what kind of group would you be joining? One that is so confident it's right, that it's actually dangerous, overly confident? People worry about that when they are thinking of becoming Christians. Maybe that's why people refuse to believe the gospel or one of the reasons. And maybe you're thinking of becoming a Christian but worried that's what people are going to think about you. You've become one of those. Well, what does the Bible say? What's really behind the decision not to believe? Should I reconsider this if I'm not a Christian? And what's really behind this kind of Christian boldness? Should I be that bold if I am a Christian? Acts chapter 4 gives an account of, of both these things, I think. Let's see how it works. Of course, Jesus here is staking a claim. Jesus stakes a claim over Jerusalem in Acts chapter 3 and 4. That doesn't mean much to us, but it meant a lot to the people who were there. They knew it meant he was staking a claim over the lives of all the people there. A crippled man is healed in the name of Jesus at the temple, the center of Jewish authority and the center of God's promises. And the authorities understand that a challenge has been laid down. They think stuff should happen around here only in our name and in our authority. Anything that happens in this place, on this temple mount. This is our space. But the name of Jesus is coming in and doing things. Staking a claim over the people. Peter says this is all because Jesus is God's anointed, his servant. Jesus is the author of life, the Messiah, the King then he says, you rejected him once and you killed him, but he rose from the dead. You cannot stop him. Now he's back to take what is his. The people of this city and this temple, this mountain, 
is his. For this to happen in this place carries all of that weight for the Jewish leaders. In other words, Peter and John are planting the flag of Jesus right there in the most provocative spot. All that you thought belonged to you by right is his. A huge flag of dominion over this place. And the authorities understand the challenge that's laid down. You can tell because they all turn up in force. It's a heck of a roll call. Uh, The priests, uh, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, the rulers, the elders, the scribes, Annas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the priestly families. In other words, all the old authority set out before them. They see Peter and John, as it were, beneath the flag of Jesus. And they say, what gives you the right? Chapter 4, verse 7. By what power or name did you do this? In other words, there's already a system in place and there's people in charge around here. Who do you think you are? Verse 2 said they were greatly disturbed. This phrase basically means really annoyed. I mean, really annoyed. We thought we were rid of this name, this claim. But here it is again. This Jesus claim keeps coming up. Why are they so disturbed? Yes, they reject Peter and John's right to teach the people because they're just ordinary men. They're not learned men, fishermen. They're uneducated. But it's more than that. It's more than that. See, Bible accounts like this are not just historical. They are historical. But they're almost always, always um, enacted parables. Enacted parables. They dramatize what the whole gospel is about. And the claim here is simple. That believing or not believing is about disputed territory. Just as, as much for us and them. In verse 11, Peter uses a temple metaphor for these temple rulers. He says, Jesus is the stone you reject, but God has made him the capstone or the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the foundation stone of the building. It sets the direction of the building. It's the strength of the building. It's the foundation, the most important, the foundation of life and life with God. This is what agitates them. And it's the claim that agitates people today and the average Australian. Why? Well, because everybody has a cornerstone that they use to justify their life to themselves, justify their life to other people, and even justify themselves to God. Some foundation that that we have put in place and that we don't want to see removed. The territory isn't Jerusalem. The battleground is every human heart. We fly a flag over our own life. That flag might have a picture of myself, or my family, or my money, or whatever. This is my loyalty. This is my code. This is my allegiance. And it becomes for us what only God deserves to be and we trust it to give us the security that only God can provide. And if a person's got half a brain and they hear the claim of Jesus, they know that he is saying, I must come in and be the cornerstone or the flag. Beneath all, above all. But we continue to give our security to other things. The ABC once featured a story about a lady named Donna Thistlethwaite. Donna attempted suicide by jumping off the Story Bridge 
in Brisbane. But she survived. What led her to do this? She was married with a young son and she was a very successful professional. But, the article pointed out, she began to struggle at work and it brought on a huge crisis. And her doctor said her achievements couldn't hold back the feeling that she was a fraud. And Donna said these words, That feeling of never quite being good enough, I've had that for a long time. And being successful at work probably kept that at bay for a bit. And so when I became less successful at work, I think, you know, then it became a really big issue for me. The cornerstone that she'd laid down was so fragile. After she survived, amazingly, she said she realised her son needed his mother and she said, I've got to be here for him. Now forgive me for getting logical, but it's the heart of the issue. Donna lost life when work went badly because it was all she was. Then she found life again in her son. But what if she loses him? What if he was to reject her? Or he was to die? What then? Find another reason to live? And what then? And what then? And what then? The flags we live under, they all come down eventually. Now the gospel shakes the Sadducees and it shakes us because it says your system's no good. You've put stuff in as the cornerstone that makes those things idols. The good aren't good enough. The smart are not smart enough. The competent are not competent enough. Your life is crying out for God. Don't you see it? When our idols come crashing down, we might hurt ourselves like Donna tried to do. Or when I hear God is staking a claim over my whole life, I might be angry like the men who are opposed to Peter and John and go, I don't want to hear that. That it's a huge flag that claims the whole world and every part of my life. And we ask, well, can anything or anyone be good and great or eternal enough to be the cornerstone of life and deserve to deserve that kind of allegiance from me? Peter, of course, says Jesus is that very thing. And so that's the source of his boldness. There's no question when we read the passage that we're meant to notice his boldness. Verse 13, the council noticed the boldness of Peter and John. They pray for great boldness later on in verse 29. And later on in verse 32, it says they spoke the word of God boldly. They speak about Jesus without fear. Why? Is it arrogant, like we said earlier? No. It's the deepest humility. It's the exhilaration of discovering that I'm not the answer to life. That I'm not my own hope. But that there is a sure answer and there is a sure hope. Peter said in chapter 3 verse 12, it's not by our power or godliness that the man was healed. It's Jesus and his name that matters. (coughs) Then he said, In chapter 3, verse 19, there's forgiveness of sins because of him. Then he said, he's risen from the dead. He's the author of life and he lives forever and he cannot be taken away. 
We do many wicked things, but he is the one who forgives, he said. We're lame in our soul, but he lets us walk again with God. Why wouldn't you want this flag over your life? Peter's simply felt the freedom that comes from letting go of the pride of thinking that he's his own answer. And that's the source of his confidence. That's why Christians surrender the territory of their life to Christ. And they want to live under his flag. But people do fear that. Flags are powerful symbols. An invading army always seeks the highest ground to stake its flag, its symbol of authority. You, know. you are under our power. Imagine living under the black flag of ISIS. Imagine living under the Nazi swastika. The terror of being under that flag. This photo is one of my favourites, an amazing photo taken at the moment of um, Hitler's defeat at the end of World War II, and it's in Berlin, it's above the German parliament. The Soviet army has liberated Europe from Nazi control, and the flag you see there is the hammer and sickle of the Soviet Union. They tore down the swastika, and they put up that flag. It seemed like a moment of freedom, but it wasn't. You see, this new flag that was flying over Berlin, that flew over East Germany and Eastern Europe, represented another tyranny, communist dictatorship, which crushed Eastern Europe for another 40 years. Years. One flag came down, another one went up. Same deal. Is this what Christian faith is like? You know, I become a Christian and I replace my old slave masters just with a new one. It won't be good. And is our Christian confidence harmful and arrogant, a flag you wouldn't want to live under? What can I say but to deny it? Yes, Christians are sinful fools like all the rest, but our master is not like all the rest. And if you make him your master, you'll have a master unlike all the rest. He's the master who lays down his life for his enemies. And he says that our circle must always be open to new people. And we don't ever plant the flag of Jesus by pushing anyone around, but only by healing people and saying his name like Peter and John. That's all we do. Leslie Newbegin, the great theologian, he said this, We have seen revolutions and we know that in most cases what has happened is simply the oppressor and the oppressed have exchanged roles. The structure is unchanged. The throne is unshaken. There's just a different person occupying it. How is the throne to be shaken? Only by the power of the gospel itself. The victory of the church over the demonic power in the Roman Empire was not won by seizing power. It was won when victims knelt down in the Colosseum and prayed in the name of Jesus for the emperor. This did not discredit or displace a particular emperor. It unmasked the entire mystique of the empire's spiritual power 
That power was disarmed and rendered powerless by such Christian love. That world-changing love is what flowers from the ground where the flag of Jesus is planted because he's like no other flag. Nothing could be less sinister than him and at the same time nothing is more powerful. That's why Christian fearlessness is always humble. Always humble. But it is bold. (laughs) And we must finish this morning by remembering that there is a boldness in Christian joy. It must make a difference to us. Doubt what you like, but never doubt that you have the grace and the love of God in Jesus. And this challenge and the boldness of Peter and John speaks to me a great deal. Their confidence that God knows and loves them. An inward boldness. And I think of all the sadness and the ungodliness that comes when I replace the work of Jesus with my own work. I was literally whistling down the street a while ago. Sometimes I do that. A happy tune. Feeling joy. And then the cloud comes over. How dare you be happy, Matthew, I said to myself, when you're such a pathetic pastor, such an average husband. I mean, if you get your competencies up, then you have the right to whistle a happy tune. When I turn to myself, joy and confidence disappear resentment towards others if it wasn't for you I'd be someone to be proud of leave me alone to feel sorry for myself and so on at the heart of Christian unhappiness is the sin of replacing the performance of Jesus with my own performance that's pride and it's how we forget that all the love and the assurance and the identity we need is in Christ Because of his grace, there is always a reason to whistle down the street and put your chin up to the world and say, my education, my reputation, my successes do not establish me. I'm not a slave to them. Then I am bold with joy and peace in my own heart. But also bold, lastly, in what I say. As I said, a Christian can doubt whatever they like, but they must never doubt the right of Jesus to reign. That kind of doubt is not a virtue. That doubt never led anyone to die for the truth or to go on mission. And this speaks to me too. I often think, well, Confidently speaking, the name of Jesus is not going to make a difference. Don't explain. So I tremble and say nothing. Even when people ask. But remember, boldness isn't a strategy to Peter. It's just what he can't help being because of all that God has done for him. And the apostles didn't pray to be spared pain. They prayed for boldness. Jesus will win. No matter which of us gets reprimanded, disinherited, gossiped about at work, kicked out, flogged, laughed at, or martyred. He will win. He rose from the dead. He is alive. He will win. But we say Christianity sounds so oppressive to so many people today and Aussies are so bored by it or angry about it. There's so little impact. Listen, God is testing our faith and our patience by making it hard. So don't stop praying. Don't stop using his name. 
We don't stop explaining why we show kindness. We don't stop giving. But we say, oh, listen, when, when the Roman world saw the first Christians, they saw, they saw Christians with grace and courage that they could not explain. We can't be that radical to the people we know here in Sydney in 2024. Yes, we can. If we pray like the apostles for the Spirit to fill us and shake us the same, people will notice that you grieve with hope like no one they've ever known. They will see your act of kindness beyond anything that they can normally explain. They'll see you give your wealth to people's need in a way they know they are not free to do. They'll see you living free. If you are living free. Then the name of Jesus, which we boldly, humbly name, will be the sound of freedom. I want to pray that it'll be that out of our church this year. Let me do that. Our Father God, we pray that the name of Jesus will go out from our lives, this church, this year, that it would humbly, boldly go out, that we'd be unembarrassed Christians, that we'd be humble servants, and that you would graciously use us, this place, these people, our lives, our prayer, our words, to bring people under the good, good flag of Jesus, to have people live their life out of the good, good cornerstone of Jesus, the one and only. For his is the only name. That saves. And so we pray in his name. Amen.